Hello and welcome to today's talk. It's the uh, end of November, the 30th of November already. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my constraints today and we'll also be looking at the strange situation in China and we'll be looking at a type of uh, natural immunity that's been completely overlooked by virtually everyone in the world apart from this paper <laughs> or a few papers but I'm going to look at one of the papers that talks about it today. So let's just start off starting off with the story I found this here. Massachusetts will give you a £75 gift card if you get vaccinated or boosted. Um, I must say I find the idea of, of these financial incentives strange. Let's just leave it at that. I find them strange. Uh, but it's near Christmas and people can use $75. Um, it's, it's a gift card if you're vaccinated against COVID-19. Goes all the way through to the 31st of December, adults and children alike. So is this going to encourage children to be vaccinated because of $75, which can seem like quite a lot of money when you haven't got it? Um, is this really the way that things are going in the United States? It would appear that it is. First dose, second dose or booster, you get $75 for whichever one it is. Boston Public Health Commission. Really, um, <laughs> I was a bit taken aback by this, as you can probably tell. Now, um, lots of people are asking me to say various things and do various things and comment on various things and debate various things. Um, the trouble is I'm a bit constrained. So this is my channel here. And I've got a channel uh, violation. I've got a, I'm on a warning. And this is quite a serious thing on YouTube. Um, I don't want another warning, that is for sure. Um, so um, th there are, obviously, on YouTube, I must abide by the YouTube terms and conditions. Uh, I make no complaint about that. Um, it's part of the deal. Uh, but let's just look at some of those terms and conditions here. Uh, in terms of commenting about vaccine safety, we can't have any content that alleges that the vaccines cause chronic side effects outside the rare side effects that are recognised by health authorities. So we can talk about the rare side effects that are known about, but not any others, apparently. Uh, moving on... Um, Efficacy of vaccines. I'm not allowed to put any content up claiming that vaccines do not reduce transmission or contraction of disease. Um, and I'm not allowed to talk about the ingredients of vaccines either, not that I would particularly want to. So um, yeah, don't, don't, don't be too hard on me. I'm not completely free to discuss pros and cons of everything that some viewers uh, email me about and uh, leave comments about. There are constraints operating in this situation. Now, I want to look at endemic human common coronaviruses. Now, the background here is there's four common coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Um, now, about 20 to 25% of colds are caused by coronaviruses. The majority are caused by rhinoviruses, but it's 20 to 25, some even say 30% of colds are caused by coronaviruses. Now, a long, long time ago, at the very start of this pandemic, we had this idea that coronaviruses, common coronaviruses that we're exposed to all the time, these have been endemic for decades, uh, if not, and, and some probably for hundreds of years, that infection with these will, will give, infection with these will give us a level of protection against SARS coronavirus 2. Is this true? Well, we now have data to answer it. Now, this has never really been taken up by Big Pharma. Um, I can't really, why would Big Pharma not want to take up a natural, uh, a natural cure like this? Because we could blow up these viruses really quite easily. It's not hard to infect someone with a cold. If you go to one of these common cold uh, research centres, they'll just put a few drips of rhinovirus in your nose and you'll get a cold. You could do the same with coronaviruses. You could have an inhaled version of the common coronaviruses and uh, that would give cross immunity according to this paper it never been done um no, not not on a commercial scale anyway 
So there's, we have these endemic human coronaviruses. Of course, I don't think you can patent a virus, so, but I don't want to get too cynical about this. Um, endemic common human coronaviruses. This is from New Jersey. They say about 20% in New Jersey, so 20, 25% of colds are these common coronaviruses and the CDC agrees and I think um, we can take the CDC uh, at their word of this uh, there's no reason why there should be um, why this should be a problem the, these are the types of coronaviruses that are endemic and cause colds uh, it doesn't matter what they are there's just four different types of related coronaviruses usually see if this is familiar usually cause mild to upper uh, moderate upper respiratory tract infections like the common cold, runny nose, sore throat, headache, fever, cough, general feeling of being unwell. Human coronaviruses can sometimes cause lower respiratory tract infections such as pneumonia or bronchitis. This is in people who have cardiopulmonary disease, um, disease of the heart or lungs, weakened immune system, infants and older adults. Um, sounds rather familiar, but of course here the CDC is talking about the four endemic common coronaviruses that have been around all my life and well before that. But the point is, if you've been infected with these, especially if you've been infected with one of these four viruses recently, is that going to give you cross immunity against SARS coronavirus 2? So in the early days, Edward Jenner inoculated James Phipps with cowpox. And that cowpox protected against smallpox. This is called cross immunity, cross reactive immunity. Is this happening between these common coronaviruses that are here all the time and SARS coronavirus too? And the answer is yes. And we're going to give the uh, evidence for that now. It's this paper here, cross reactive memory T cells. Now I think most of us know now the memory T cells remember the infection and the T helper cells will stimulate the B cells to make the antibodies and the T cytotoxic cells will directly kill virally infected cells. Absolutely vital. It's hard to say that one part of the immune system is more important than the other, but this probably is the most important part of the immune system, the sensitization of these absolutely vital cells called small lymphocytes, the B and the T cells, the small lymphocytes, especially the memory ones that can hang around. In some cases, for some infections, we know for multiple decades. How long that's going to be with SARS coronavirus 2 is not that clear yet. This is from Nature Communications, peer-reviewed, good, good journal, no problem there. Um, Cross-reactive immune response, common cold coronaviruses and SARS coronavirus 2. The frequency of baseline cross-reactive uh, T cells. So what they did here was the, they went into homes where um, someone had just been infected with, or households where someone had just been infected with SARS coronavirus 2. And before they could make an immunological response, the other members of the household, they tested them for um, T cells um, related to previous coronaviruses. And what they found was that people that had been exposed to previous coronaviruses, as indicated by their T cells, had protection against SARS coronavirus 2. But this has never been taken up as a preventative. We went down the vaccine route rather than the stimulation of natural immunity route. But that's what this paper was about. Um, now it's, color it's, it's correlated with the infection outcomes following SARS coronavirus 2 exposure. So if you've been exposed to these natural coronaviruses, especially recently, um, the more recently the better, as long as it's been at least a couple of weeks, then you have a better outcome from SARS coronavirus 2, from COVID disease. We observe a significantly high frequency of cross-reactive memory T cells responses in PCR negative contacts. In other words, the people that are tested positive for having these T cells, which are sensitized to fight the, the uh, common cold coronaviruses, they were so effective that people infected with SARS coronavirus 2 or people exposed, should we say, to SARS coronavirus 2 didn't generate enough SARS coronavirus 2 virus to become positive at PCR. And we know these PCR tests are exquisitely sensitive. So basically that means they didn't detect, they didn't generate detectable amounts of virus. And of course, if you don't generate detectable amounts of virus, you're not going to be sick. It's pretty... Uh, Pretty obvious, really, if not um, 
commercially interesting. So 52 households uh, study peripheral blood mononuclear cells. That, 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 so these lymphocytes only have one nucleus. Um, so um, in other words, they're studying the lymphocytes, particularly the T cell lymphocytes. Uh, for specific spike nuclear plasmid membrane envelope and ORF1 SARS coronavirus 2 epitopes. In other words, these are the parts of the coronaviruses that these T cells had been sensitized to, to recognize and to act against these viral antigens. And the epitope is the part of the antigen that the immune system actually specifically recognizes as being foreign. So they tested for all of those, and um, the results were pretty interesting. By the way, the ORF stands for open reading frame. It, it's about a tenth of the viral genome, so it's the first tenth of the viral genome. So that actually works. Uh, so so the, 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 uh, the T cells can actually recognize the very RNA of the virus and act against that as well as the other structural components of the virus. These T cells cross react with human endemic coronaviruses, and the human endemic coronaviruses cross react with the SARS coronavirus, too. Quite clever, really. Uh, we observe high frequencies of cross reactivity. Memory T cells cross react with nucleoplasmid specific antigens significantly. So the, the T cells are very good at recognizing the nucleoplasmid um, part of the, uh, the coronaviruses. They weren't so good at recognizing the spike protein part of the viruses. So when someone is getting immunity or partial immunity to SARS coronavirus 2, having been exposed to these natural coronaviruses, the part of the natural coronavirus that's stimulating the T cells is, is not the spike protein. It is perhaps, it is in fact, mostly this um, nucleoplasmid specific bit. So in that case, you might think that it would be better to make vaccines based on nucleocapsid proteins rather than spike proteins. And if you thought that, I would tend to agree with you, and so would these researchers. Um, memory T cells did not seem to cross-react with pre-existing spike reactive T cells. Interesting. Our results are thus consistent with the pre-existing non-spike cross-reactive memory T cells. In other words, it's not the T cells. The, the, it, it, sorry, it's, it's not the spike protein that the T cells are reacting to, it's other parts of the virus. They're not, they're not particularly responding to the spike protein, they're responding to other parts of the virus. So um, cross-reactivity memory T cells protecting against SARS coronavirus to naive contacts from infection. So it's the T cells recognizing other parts of the virus, not the spike protein. Having learned that from the um, common cold coronaviruses are applying that to the SARS coronavirus too, but it's not the spike protein bit that's working best. And yet the vaccines are based on the spike protein. I, I really want to know why the drug companies chose the spike protein to make their all the vaccines against, apart from the Chinese, apart from the Sinovac. Why didn't they choose many of the other parts of the virus? <clears throat> apart from anything else, the spike protein is the quickest mutation, mutating part why didn't they choose the uh, nucleocapsid or, or any of these other parts of the, any of these other parts of the virus? You know, they could have chosen any of these other parts. They could have chosen the um, nucleoplasmid membrane envelope protein ORF SARS-CoV-2. They could have they could have chosen all these bits, but they chose the spike protein. And I don't know that they've published their rationale for doing this. It does seem a strange choice. And this research confirms it. If they'd pick the nucleocapsid, for example, and made the vaccine against that as opposed to against the spike protein, it would have probably, <coughs> it would appear from this, that it would have stimulated the T cells more, especially the memory T cells, and that would have given us longer lasting immunity. Don't know why they didn't do that, but they didn't. So very interesting research, um, uh, uh, and, and basically they're saying thereby supporting the inclusion of non-spike antigens in the second generation vaccines. But other than the Chinese ones, I don't know of any ones that are doing this. 
strange, but true. Now, China itself, what is going on? Um, relatively low vaccination rates in the over 80s and over, over 60s. And um, a British company, a British group have said that uh, there's 1.3 to 2.1 million lives at risk. Now, the news from China, of course, is very, very difficult to work out. It, it's, it's often not transparent in any way, shape or form. But there again, our news is not often transparent in any way, shape or form, either from some of our mainstream media providers. And I'm not familiar with this, uh, the, the way that these numbers have been arrived at. But I'm not sure that the way that Western media looks at China is always objective. In fact, I'm sure it's not any more than the data coming out of China uh, is, is objective. It's a pity. It's a great pity. Um, so, but yeah, yeah, OK, there's lives at risk. There's no question about that. Um, up to November the 26th. Now, th th there's... This was the 26th. There was 39,791 new cases. That was the day before. That was the day before that. So uh, for three days now, very large increases. Only a few imported cases. Literally 99 or more percent are, are domestic spread. In other words, this virus is well and truly spreading now in China. And I don't really see any way that, um, any way that it can be effectively stopped now. It is spreading... Um, in major areas in China, they're trying to stop it with just these, some might say, barbaric lockdown strategies. But I just don't think it's possible. And maybe this is why we can't get things at the moment. <laughs> you might have noticed quite a few things are in short supply uh, because a lot of them are made in China. And, and China is, is suffering economically uh, to a massive extent. Um, I'm not worried about the whole Chinese economy, but individual poor Chinese people, are, it's heartbreaking for these people. Totally heartbreaking. Um, now, of the 39,791 cases, 3,709 were symptomatic. 36,000 were asymptomatic, just over. And there was one death. So... And we don't know about that death, whether there was comorbidities or, or what there was. So this draconian lockdown for, for what is perhaps limited benefit. And of course, if you have lockdown, people are sharing less of these um, common cold coronaviruses. Therefore, they're actually reducing their level of protection. We've seen this with the resurgence of viral infections in Western countries in the past months, past six months, with more respiratory sensitial virus infections uh, because people have lost their natural um, immunity by being constantly re-exposed to these things. Every time you're re-exposed to one of these viral agents, you're going to generate more immunity to it. This is just basic immunology. So quite what's going on in China there, very, very strange. Um, and it is inevitable that it is inevitable that SARS coronavirus 2 will become endemic in China, the same as everywhere else in the world. The only point is, how did they get to that point? The Sinovac vaccine actually is different to the other ones that we're using in the West. It takes the whole virus and actually attenuates it. And the, the, the coverage you get from Western countries tends to demigrate this approach, suggesting that you should buy lots of mRNA vaccines off sophisticated Western companies. But... Um, if they're using the whole virus, that's going to give a whole range of uh, antigenic epitopes for the immune system to work on. So uh, I think we need more data on the efficacy of the Chinese vaccine or the lack of it. There is data that it is protective against severe disease and death. Um, but there again, so would the um, exposure to the other coronaviruses be uh, that we are not uh, using? So if you were exposed to one of these other coronaviruses, say through uh, a spray in your nose, if someone was to develop such a spray, then you'd, you'd, you might have a terrible cold for three or four days. But then you'd have uh, cross immunity, as illustrated by this research that we have um, looked at. Not absolute, nothing's absolute, but it's better than, uh, a lot better than, um, it's a lot better than um, 
nothing. So there we are, some interesting things to think about. Um, natural immunity is really the only effective long-term strategy. Um, I wish we would use it more than we are. And thank you for watching.